Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream on the 27th of February 2024. It's Martin North here from Digital Finance Analytics. Great to have you on this evening. We're going to have an interesting conversation about uh, crypto related matters and how they intersect with uh, mainstream finance. And uh, we will compare and contrast some quite interesting uh, statistics, I think, as well as we as we go through to that. And um, just before I bring Adam in, I will remind you, as I always do, that uh, we don't provide specific financial or legal advice. This is a general conversation only. Uh, please uh, feel free to comment in the chat and ask questions. But uh, we do moderate the chat, so just bear that in mind, please. This is as of 27th of February 24, if you're watching in replay. And if you'd like to ask a question or to get my attention, if you use at Walk the World to do that. The reason for that is that there's so much going on in the chat that uh, it's quite difficult for me to follow everything. But uh, if you use Outwater the World, it comes to a separate queue. And that means that I can see it. And I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your question top of the list or indeed make a contribution to what we do around here. And I have to appreciate those who've already uh, contributed into the chat and suggest I buy some more Bitcoin. I have to buy, say, more Bitcoin because I've already got Bitcoin. So uh, that's a really appreciated uh, contribution. And um, we look forward to the conversation as it progresses. And without further ado, let me bring Adam in. Adam, how are you doing? G'day, Martin. So good to see you. <laughs> yeah, indeed. It's been a few uh, few months since we were on last. And uh, things have moved quite uh, significantly, right? But uh, how are you doing down there? It's bloody hot where I am compared to where you are, but I was just saying um, to my audience that before, sometimes I venture into your space, it's been a rough week or month or time in crypto. Today is not that day. This week has been very good, particularly today. Bitcoin breaking out much quicker than we expected. We've got the halving coming up. We've got a lot of institutional money coming in. Things are looking very, very good in the crypto land. <laughs> it's just quite different. And uh, just for those watching in Australia, uh, this is the Australian chart, right, which is now 86077, which is, um, you know, quite a, a significant hike up from where it was. <clears throat> I guess if you if we take a, you know, a, a longer term view, um, you can see there that it's been a, you know, an interesting rocky road um, up down, but we're now back really close to all time highs. And uh, I think that's quite significant. Um, What's going to happen ahead, of course, is always the interesting question. But uh, there are some interesting signs that uh, maybe this time is different. Uh, who knows? We've got the Bitcoin halving that's coming up, but we, we normally expect to see these moves after the Bitcoin halving. So the Bitcoin halving is on the 20th of April. Yet we're seeing the whole market slide left. And what we mean by that is we were looking at four year cycles where typically after four years when the halving comes a few months after that halving we see a bit of a breakout but that breakout is occurring much earlier so you know will the market pull back i think a little bit of a pullback is healthy but the reality is we're seeing so much money pouring into this market it's just from the us spot backed etfs alone up to half a billion dollars in fact in one week more than half a billion that's 500 million us dollars pouring into these markets to back those spot backed ETFs with cold hard Bitcoin. That is, this is a futures market. This is the real stuff. You have to back these ETFs with something. And I would suggest this is only just beginning because we have not even the retail investors coming in. In the previous cycles, we've seen this thing run away with the retail investors. That's just like the mums, the dads, the you's and me's coming in and putting in a little bit of our pocket money and getting a, a above a trillion dollar US market. But now we have the perfect storm, Martin. We have the perfect storm in the sense that we have the spot-backed ETFs approved and billions of dollars pouring in. We have a presidential election year, which means interest rates will be lowered because, yeah, look at me, I've reduced the interest rate, so that puts more money <laughs> into the markets. We've got the halving coming up, combined with the four-year cycle, which of course comes with that halving. But then we also have the potential of an Ethereum spot-backed ETF. Now, for all of any one of these things alone is enough to drive the market up. But com with all of them combined, and then as we'll talk about a bit later, of course, the US debt clock going through the roof, I think we're at $34 trillion and counting very quickly as we go up, and that's only what we know of. People are moving to this asset, not just for speculation. They're actually, they need it. They need to protect themselves from inflation. Inflation is out of control. But even in, if you want to protect yourself from inflation or you want to uh, you know, buy low and sell high, as many people are in this space, Bitcoin is more than that. Bitcoin is not one thing, it's many things. And I articulate, again, as at this stage, we see over 2 million cryptocurrencies. And you might say, well, hang on, which one do I invest in? Well, there's over 3 billion websites. So keep that in mind. There's more than 3,000 million websites. And there's about 2 million cryptos. The main cryptos we're looking at is about 20,000. So you've got 20,000 companies, if you will, that you can invest in there. 
And just because there's lots of companies to invest in doesn't mean that they're all a scam because many are going to zero, just as many companies go to zero. And I mark my words over the long run, many cryptos will go to zero. But you get the right cryptos, and that's pretty much the top 100 at this stage, you're looking very, very good. Even if you don't hold forever, you can step on this wave of money and then step off and um, do what you will with those profits. (laughs) <laughs> well, now let's just stand back slightly because clearly one of the big compare and contrasts is crypto versus, you know, the broader financial markets. But let's just put a few facts on the table, right? Fact one, never been so much debt in the global market. This is actually the most recent data from the IIF, right? Never been higher. And, uh, you know, if you look at the global debt clock, it continues to click up. And another way of looking at is to look at it uh, in terms of the um, breakdown. So it's the rise of indebtedness across households, non-corporate financials, governments, and the finance sector. So everybody, everybody is still seeing debt rising. And I think that's a very interesting and very important uh, point of departure, not least because, of course, central banks are saying, well, we're, we're reducing our balance sheet, right? But if you look at the US, the Treasury in the US have issued, I think, about a, you know, um, a, a trillion of, of new debt quite recently. So, you know, the total debt bomb in the world has never been higher. So whilst people always say, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin is founded on nothing, the question is, is real, <laughs> is real money founded on anything at all? Or is it actually being expanded by, by this debt bomb? Second point, this is the NVIDIA chart which um, basically came in at uh, 790.96 overnight. And, uh, you know, NVIDIA is trading at 40 times earnings. And uh, I'm prompted just to remember that there was a a, a firm called Sun Microsystems and a guy called Scott McKeeley, who was the uh, CEO, um, around the time of the dot-com boom, he actually wrote to his shareholders and prospective investors saying, at 10 times income, um, you know, PE of 10 times, um, you are expecting me to basically double my income, quadruple my income, you know, effectively pay no tax, and it's probably still overvalued. NVIDIA is 40 times. And, and so the question is, you know, where are we? I don't know what you think, Adam, but if, you, if I look at the, you know, the quote, real world, um, then maybe things are not quite as um, uh, compare and contrast as some would want to see. Uh, third data point, just for, throw back to you, global house points, uh, price prices are now at another turning point, they're saying. So house prices are also going up. So wherever you look, wherever you've got, look, you've got the inflation of debt, the inflation of quasi value, but the question is, is it anchored at anything on against anything? And I think that's an important context for thinking about Bitcoin. I, I really appreciate that you've you've laid out the foundation there because let, let's face it, there's a bit of a divide in understanding what money is. You know, in its essence, it's a store of value, a medium of exchange, and a unit of account. But money is more than that. Money is a store of energy. It's a store of effort. It's also a language. And it's it's something that we want to secure our, our time and energy into something. But if you're doing it into a money that is constantly being eroded through inflation, then it's theft. And fiat in its core is theft because they are stealing your money every year they print, every month that they print, every time a fractionally reserved loan comes out, they are eroding eroding everyone's savings, time, effort, energy, store of value, whatever you want to call it, it's theft. The antithesis to this is a hard, sound, immutable, immutable, borderless, censorship-resistant money. But if that sounds too fancy, let's keep it simple. What's the antithesis to an unlimited money? The antithesis to an unlimited money is a limited money. And it doesn't matter what you want to call it, whether you want to call it gold or Bitcoin or seashells or beads or sand or whatever, There's only one thing that's truly unlimited in the earth, and that's fiat. There's no limit to it. They just keep printing it. Even if you kind of look at, you know, you step out, you're a philosopher like myself, you step right, you know, right back and you say, well, sand is unlimited. Well, there's actually only so much sand there is on the earth. And you say, well, there's rocks. Well, you grind down the rocks and there's only so much rocks. There's only so much water. There's only so much land. But when it comes to fiat, fiat is truly unlimited. So we need to look for a money, whatever that money is, which is the opposite of unlimited. And the opposite of unlimited is limited. 
And that's what Bitcoin starts off with the premise of no one can print more of this. No one can dilute it. No one can inflate it away. There is a supply of 21 million. That's it. And that's the starting point. The second point to this is it needs to be digital as we live in a digital age. Some people um, get angry at digital, but everything goes digital. Even the money we use now, even digital fiat exists. We already use digital money. We have digital messaging systems, digital videos, digital communication, digital, digital almost everything when we do in business. But what we haven't digitized yet as a global community is money. And I'm not talking about digitizing fiat money where it's unlimited. I'm talking about digitizing something that is scarce. And that is Bitcoin, 21 million. So when people are coming around now, of course, when we first got into Bitcoin, it got a bad name because people used it on the Silk Road to buy and sell drugs. But of course, when we used the internet in the very first days, even though it was a messaging system, we saw the sex and porn industry and even child trafficking industry were doing bad things with the internet. That didn't mean the internet was bad. It just meant that initially it was used for bad things. And the same, I would argue, potentially was for Bitcoin, where people were buying and selling drugs on the Silk Road. And that is a stigma that has stayed with this currency for more than 15 years. We're well past that. If you want to commit a crime, you don't leave a digital trail using Bitcoin because Bitcoin is not anonymous. It's pseudonymous, which is very different. So if we're going to talk about the criminal space, fiat is the money of crime. It's the money of crime in two main ways. One, someone at the top, not you, not me, they get to keep printing it. And that printing is stealing what we have earned in the past because they dilute our savings. The second part of the criminality of fiat is if you want to commit a crime, you don't use Bitcoin, you use the US dollar. Now, whether you want to use the US dollar in cash or by moving it through massive central bodies such as banks, that's where the money is of true crime. It's not done in the digital space. But of course, what we can see now is that the banks have never really had competition in the past. Centralized or retail or commercial banks have never really had competition. And now they do have that competition. First they ignore it, then they tease it, then they fight it, and then they embrace it. And we're now moving into the stage of embracing this technology. And what I come forth into your space and say, look, we're all battling out here. We just want to, we just want to actually survive before we even get ahead. So you, you survive before you thrive. But at the moment, because of the inflation that you just described, Martin, through multiple charts that have nothing to do with Bitcoin, people aren't thriving. They're actually struggling to survive. So what's the solution? Well, we have a solution and this solution is out here. And now many people are waking up to this. Don't worry about the name. Don't worry about the color. Don't worry about the logo. What we really need to worry about in the first instance is an unlimited ver money versus a scarce money. And we now have this scarce money and the people are waking up to it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I find this quite fascinating because one of the things that we've seen now is the intersection of many of the philosophies from mainstream finance coming into the Bitcoin environment. So, you know, you mentioned the Bitcoin spot ETFs, right? Now, it's very interesting. These large organizations that actually launch those ETFs, they're actually making money in traditional ways by effectively packaging up and selling access to Bitcoin through to the wider investment markets they're clipping the ticket on the way through. So they're generating significant returns. We've also got a lot of um, uh, speculators, of course, and a lot of the uh, finance trading is speculation rather than actually uh, fundamentally driven. And they've been piling into the AI um, part of the market. You know, the argument is, well, this is a completely different, this is a new world. And I, I tell you, I'm old enough. <laughs> to remember the dot-com bubble, right? And prior to the dot-com bubble uh, and, and the pop, um, the number of um, analysts who were saying, we're in a completely new world, a different world, the world has changed forever. I have to say, I'm quite sceptical of the idea that suddenly AI is now the this new revolution. And it's interesting, if you look at the stock markets overall, and you actually do equal weight rather than actually, you know, the AI sector of the market, the markets have hardly moved at all relative to uh, the AI sector. So um, clearly there's something going on, but a lot of people are piling in and getting on the bandwagon. So th this idea of, of bandwagons and everybody piling in is not something which is isolated simply to the crypto or the Bitcoin world, right? It is the essence of how many people think about the finance sector overall. And there are winners and there are losers. If you're actually able to trade and get in and get out, 
um, then, you know, maybe you'll do okay. But the question is who ultimately is paying the price for all of this stuff, right? And, and how much longer can we just go on and on and on with this inflating bubble of debt, um, which is government sponsored and which is central bank, central bank backed? Um, and that hence the, the, the critical question is, well, is there an alternative? And if there is, um, what does that alternative mean? And postscript, of course, central bankers are also talking about central bank digital currencies almost as an antidote to the crypto world and to Bitcoin. So they're clearly worried and concerned about what's going on in, in crypto land. But to my mind, they're just, um, um, you know, playing the old games. And to my mind, what, what I'm seeing here now in, in sharp high contrast is that there are some old world and new world behaviors that are colliding this battle is a really interesting battle to watch, though. Yeah, a few really good points here. So firstly, on inflation, I think what's quite interesting is when governments print too much money and the inflation rate goes too high, because inflation isn't the inflation of prices. Inflation, and I know you know this, but just to put things in context, inflation isn't the inflation of prices. Inflation is the inflation of the money supply. But who can increase the money supply? I can't do it. You can't do it governments can't do it now if, uh, governments can do it now of course governments say we can't do it because the banks did it but if i print money i go to jail so there is a system in place where governments the people with guns and the laws and the control and the cages where we put people who are bad they have allowed a system where they can print more money so whether you want to say it's a central bank or fractional reserve lending it doesn't matter it's the governments because the government said you over there you can print money but you over there you can't print money so ultimately it comes down to the governments now this is a good thing because hopefully we vote for governments and we have some control over those actions of the governments great well of course when we go to inflation and superinflation and we're go i'd argue we're moving into superinflation and then hyperinflation as we can see other nations the dominoes are starting to fall nation by nation they all start to fall and as the US dollar goes up on the DXDY, it's not that the US dollar is getting more powerful. No, 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 no. It's what it's compared to looks more powerful. It's because what it's compared to is falling down. So you say, look how well the US dollar is performing. No, it's not. It's not that it's performing well. It's that everything else is falling down. And I can prove this because a US dollar can't buy more in America now than what it could years ago because they are dealing with inflation as well. So the irony of it all, Martin, is where the government says, hey, Australia, we're going to stick with Australia at the moment. You need to stop spending money. You're spending too much money. You're buying too much food. You're buying too many cars. You're going on too many holidays. You're looking after rent and living expenses. Stop spending money. But here's the thing. It's all projection. It's not about us spending money. It's about the government spending money. Because when the government spends money, there's only two ways they can get it. They can get it either through taxes, taking it off the people, or by printing it. When I spend money, my money, I'm not inflating the money supply. Sure, if it's in my bank, I've taken it out of the bank and put it into the circulating supply of money, but there's a, two different numbers. There's a circulating supply and a total supply. The circulating supply of money is the money that I take out of my bank or my wallet or from underneath my mattress and I put it into the economy and it starts circulating around the economy. The total money supply is all of that money, including the money that's in the bank and under the mattress. But when we increase the money supply, when we inflate the money supply, me buying a loaf of bread does not inflate the money supply. It might change the circulating supply, but it doesn't inflate the money supply. The only people, the only entities that can inflate the money supply are governments, fact. So the irony of all of this is when they say, it's your fault, Australia, you spent too much money, you bought too much bread and you paid for electricity in your house, it's your fault that it went up. Or as we saw with President uh, Biden, he's like, oh, the companies are bad because of shrinkflation. Now, shrinkflation is at the other end of inflation where companies can only put the price up so high before they realize, hey, no one's going to pay $50 for a bar of chocolate. What we'll do is we'll shrink the product. Now, the government say, oh, that's you bad companies. No, it's not. It's not bad companies. It's that they are trying to survive. They can only put the prices so high because the money supply has been inflated, therefore purchasing power has been eroded. So then they have to go to the other end of the spectrum where they actually make their product smaller. But in any case, it's not because of you. It's not because of me. It's not because of um, greedy corporations, as they say. It's because the money printer went brr. And because this money printer continues to print money, those at the very top get richer and richer whilst the rest of us get poorer and poorer because when this money is printed 
those at the top get the first cut of it. They get to access that money quickly when it's still got today's value. They buy capital assets that go up in price very quickly. And by the time the money has trickled down to the rest of us at the bottom, it's already lost its purchasing power. And that creates a massive wealth gap between the haves and the have, not, have nots. And that's why you can see the wealth gap getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not because of companies making their products smaller. It's not because I bought a loaf of bread. It's because they keep printing this money and those who get the money first are those at the top. And by the time it trickles down to the bottom, it's eroded everyone's purchasing power and it's also eroded everyone's savings power. Now, when we look at the house um, prices of houses, as an example, because we love our property in Australia and I've got a lot of property, so I'm not against it. Has your house really gone up or has the money that you need to buy it gone down? Now, I sent you a, um, a graph a bit before. Are you able to bring it up? Now, rather than me being the crypto guy talking about it, I think it's fairer that you as the neutral economist, can you explain to me the graph that you're looking at? <laughs> well, it's clearly it's the average house price for the US, but actually shown in Bitcoin, right? And there's something rather interesting in that and the relativity between the two charts. So the green line shows us that over time, between 2000 and 2011 and 2024, you need more and more fiat to buy a house. But over time, you need less and less Bitcoin to buy that same house. So we're so addicted to these charts going up where we want a capital asset to go up. But in a deflationary environment, and of course, we've been told that deflation is bad. No, what deflation ultimately means is that your money gets more purchasing power. That's what that graph shows. The graph ultimately shows that the, when you use fiat and unlimited money, it loses its purchasing power. Therefore, you need more of it to buy a house. But when you have a deflationary money, that is a money that becomes more and more scarce over time, you need less of that money to buy the same house. So what actually happens is over time with a deflationary money such as Bitcoin, is you, your purchasing power actually increases. But here's the best thing with Bitcoin. It keeps the rules the same for everyone. I can't print it, you can't print it, governments can't print it. More importantly, when you mentioned that the United States government recently printed a trillion dollars, do you know where most of that money went? It went to war. It went to the war in Ukraine. Now, whether you like the war in Ukraine or not, that doesn't matter. What matters is that it costs money to fund wars. And I can guarantee you, Martin, if the war in Ukraine, and don't worry about whether right or wrong, we're just talking about the essence of war. I can guarantee you that if the United States government had to send a billion dollars to Ukraine every few months by taking gold out of Fort Knox, they would not be funding that war. And I can guarantee you that most governments who are funding wars through printing money, they would not be taking their reserves out of gold stocks to go fund wars in other countries. So what does that mean? It ultimately means that fiat is a money of war. Besides being a money of theft, it's also a money of war. Because what backs the US dollar? What backs the US dollar is the biggest war machine in the world. But what also backs the US dollar is the fact that if you don't use it, if you pull away from these systems, you can, you can expect sanctions, be accused of being an oligarch, having your bank accounts raided, uh, stop using the SWIFT network. So money, fiat, has been weaponized in that sense. It's been weaponized twice. Once, if we don't like what you're doing, we're going to rob your bank accounts, cut you out of the system and call you bad, and then you can't access this. Okay, that's one part. The second part is that if you want to go to war, you don't actually need money anymore to be taken out of gold reserves in your stocks, or you don't need to sell a building that you own land. All you do is you print the money. And that is why fiat is a money of war, because if you have a scarce, hard, sound money that you can't dilute through printing, therefore stealing your people's money from their savings account, it changes the behavior of governments. It is a very different war frontage when you have to actually liquidate your hard holdings to fight a war in another land, as opposed to just pr simply pressing print. Yeah, and um, just to uh, re-emphasize one of the things that, that, that you said there, and I think it's really important, um, the ratio of, um, you know, say income to the cost of a property in many areas, including Australia, have gone way out of kilter, which essentially is not necessarily that the value of your property has gone up. The value of your money has gone down. 
And, exactly. And, and that's a really, really important and quite shocking thing to think about, right? Because effectively it turns the whole argument on its head and actually inflating house prices um, whilst, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, I feel richer. Well, actually, not necessarily, because if you went and bought the same property again, you'd have to spend the same amount of money again. <laughs> right? So this is a, you know, it, it's one of those sort of mental gymnastic things to think about. Right. And it comes back to a fundamental question. Where does value actually lie? Right. And who is controlling the value logic? Now, I think that's a really important point. The truth is that in the in the fiat world, it's the governments and central banks who are playing the piper and we have to dance to that tune. But the question is, is that actually good for us? And uh, you, you mentioned winners and losers. Well, I see the losers all the time in my surveys where people are really struggling to get by at the moment. So whilst, you know, the debt is expanding and, you know, the value of assets are going up, et cetera, et cetera, real people aren't feeling it. And there's a, there's a fundamental disconnect, which, frankly, I get quite cross about. It's a really good point, actually, from your friend Peter Schiff. Now, Peter Schiff, I listen to a lot. He loves gold and he hates Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But I'm always keen to hear the other side. Now, he raised a really good point. I was listening to one of his live podcasts the other day, and he, he said that, he got a call from his government or insurance company and said, oh, congratulations, your house has gone up $50,000 in value. And he's like, normally you'd say, oh, that's great. My house has gone up in value. But he's like, oh, no, my house has gone up in value. Now, why did he go, oh, no? Because he had to pay more insurance. He had to pay more rates. And then when he sells that house, he has to pay more capital gains tax. So really think about that. The your property goes up in value. So you think, yeah, look at me. Well, all the other properties have gone up in value. So it's not like you can sell this house and now buy two other houses, keeping all things consistent with your location is, and so forth. Your house has gone up in value, great, but everyone else's house has gone up in value. But if you're not selling that house, your rates have gone up, your insurance has gone up, and your capital gains has gone up. So do you actually really want your house that you live in that you're not going to sell, you're not going to borrow against? Do you really actually want it to go up so you can pay more rates, more insurance, and if you do sell, more stamp duty or more um, capital gains tax? Now, of course, if you own your house, we won't go into the whole tax thing, but many people have multiple properties. Now, the second part when you say, where is the value determined? And, and you allude to that the governments determine the values. No, no they don't. They can't. I, I tell you where the value is. The truth is in the markets. The market determines the value, not the government, not a gun, not a law, not, not a federal banker. Where, where the market, where the money value is determined is in the markets, and I can prove it. It doesn't matter what the US government says to me. If they say a dollar's worth a dollar, they should be saying, well, a dollar is worth a can of Coke. Well, no, it's not, because they only need $2 for a can of Coke. And it doesn't matter how many aircraft carriers the United States government has. It doesn't matter who we vote in in politics, whether it's Labor or Liberal. If the market determines that a can of Coke, and I'm just using that as one anchor point, if they say that a can of Coke is worth $2, or, or more importantly, you need $2 to buy that can of Coke, then that's what the can of Coke is worth. So how much is a Bitcoin worth? A Bitcoin at time of recording right now as we speak is worth 56,388 US dollars. Now, why is it worth $56,388? It's because that's what the market said it's worth. I didn't say it's worth that much. You didn't say it's worth that much. The government didn't say it's worth that much. The military didn't say it's worth that much. The Bitcoin company, which doesn't exist, didn't say it's worth that much. The freedom of the market said it's worth that much. So how do we relate this to democracy? Well, if a money, if we are truly free and we have freedom of association, freedom of speech, freedom of commerce, freedom of movement, the foundation, the layer one to everything is a free money. And fear is not a free money. Fear is not a free money because someone gets to print it at the top. And if I choose not to use it on the global stage, I can have sanctions put against me. Or if you ask Iraq or Libya or other countries or Panama even how it went when they said, no, we're not sure about using this dollar thing anymore. Look what happened to their leaders. They got taken out. That is a pure money of violence. Now, sure, we're told it was weapons of mass destructions and human rights. Was it really? Or was it really the fact that when, get, when these countries said, yeah, I don't think that's a good deal. I don't like being a hostage to someone else's financial policy. And I don't like the fact that I have to create real value through real work. And you get to just print that money. I'm out. Well, then they got taken out. 
But where things are changing massively now, and we don't even have to talk about Bitcoin, we can talk about the reality of the world. The world is waking up and saying, you know what? I saw all those sanctions put on Russia. Now, Russia might be bad, it might be good, it might be neutral, I might not know anything about Russia, that doesn't matter. What is a matter of fact is when one country made a move, another country cut them out of the financial system. And money, to be fair and open, it must be neutral. And we showed that the US dollar could be weaponized. And that was actually, if the US dollar wants to maintain its power as a global reserve currency, whether it likes it or not, its money must remain neutral. Sure, they can use their military how they want, they can do uh, diplomatic relations and so forth. But the second you weaponize money, countries have to pull out. Because what if I one day do something that America doesn't like? And I, I can't go to a, law, a court of law. I don't get a fair trial. The Americans, the American power at the top just says, oh, we don't like what you're doing. We're going to cut you out of the financial system. Oh, and by the way, you're an oligarch, so we're going to steal all your money. And you can't use a SWIFT network. And we're going to make sure there's no international trade using our money. Well, what that forces nations to do, China goes, oh, we don't really want to end up like Russia. And then India goes, well, we're not going to play that game. We're still going to buy the cheap oil. And that reduced the demand on the US dollar. So it's another reason why the US dollar is going down. And I'm, I must emphasize, I'm not having a go at America. I'm having a go at fiat. I've lived in America, loved in America, studied in America, served with the American Defense Force. I'd be happy to do it again. What I'm saying is money must be neutral. And if we have a global reserve currency that is not neutral and can be weaponized, people will seek alternatives. And that is why people are now going to Bitcoin, not because to, not to get a Lambo, not because of ETFs, not because they like the name of it, but because it is a neutral money, a neutral money that is free from anyone controlling it, whether we like it or not. Yeah. And what I find interesting about this, this conversation is that um, if you listen to some central bankers, they've been throwing rocks at Bitcoin for a long, long time. And, you know, you've got to ask the question, why is it that they're throwing rocks? And I think they're throwing rocks because they can see that the logic behind Bitcoin is a fundamentally different logic to the one that they've been occupying for the last generation or two, right? And, of course, central banks are part of the, the, a particular world system and a finance system that is fundamentally built on the US dollar. And, uh, you know, I often say that, um, you know, whatever you think about the US dollar compared with many other currencies, it's probably one of the better ones. Um, and that's why a lot of uh, funds drift to US dollars even now. Um, if you look at the trade internationally, there's quite a lot of done in dollars, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually necessarily um, particularly, um, you know, of great momentum, um, unless, of course, the system is controlled and manipulated by, you know, central bankers and, um, and, and governments. And I sometimes say to people, the thing you've got to bear in mind, a lot of US dollars are outside the control of the US. They're in the, you know, the euro dollars. And if you look at the euro dollars and what's going on over there, you've got some big question marks there too. So, you know, you've got on one hand all the rocks being thrown. But actually, if you look at the way the finance system works, the finance system is doing precisely the same as the system that they're throwing rocks at. How does that work? Exactly. A really good point, because projection is an amazing concept, because they're saying, oh, it's not us. That, that's the scam money. That's the bad money. Oh, really? Okay. Well, where does all the money laundering occur? It doesn't happen in Bitcoin. It happens through the US dollar and through centralized banking systems. Just look at what happened with HSBC. Even the CBA at one stage was laundering money, either intentionally or unintentionally. They certainly got a fine for it. I won't go there because who wants litigation against the biggest bank in Australia? But ultimately, you can see where the bad stuff is happening. Now, what you can also see, as a matter of fact, is that while the banks were saying, don't buy this asset, don't buy this asset because this asset is bad, they were buying it. We can see that big banks, big financial institutions have been stockpiling this asset in the background whilst telling you, mum and dad, don't buy this thing, it's bad. Well, mark my words, there is going to be a pivot where suddenly when they've got the big pile of digital gold, so to speak, they're going to say, oh, now it's good. Now you can buy. And I can prove it because it's already happened with BlackRock, the biggest funds, the biggest asset manager in the world. You, there is clear evidence that they said Bitcoin bad, it's got no value, we never... We would never work in it. And then a few years later, 
they somehow convinced the SEC, an arm of the US government, to say, no, you will approve our spot back to ETFs, and we, were, we are going to put half a million dollars, sorry, half a billion dollars a week into this asset to stockpile this. So most of us who have been in this space, we, we, it's the first time we actually got to front run the big boys. We front ran the market, and we've got the stockpiles of Bitcoin. But then when the big boys were waking up and saying, oh, hang on a second, this is actually a fundamentally sound technology. It's actually a fundamentally sound investment asset. It's actually a fundamentally sound a tool for many things beyond. So, because remember, Bitcoin's not one thing, it's many things. So then when they got the ETF approved, they've started pouring money into it. And so have the individuals. So you see big corporations buying Bitcoin. I might use Michael Saylor as an example. Now, he's an, uh, an ally of Bitcoin. But his company, MicroStrategy, has over 190,000 Bitcoin, but that's only his company. I can assure you now, he has a lot of Bitcoin himself as an individual, as does his staff. And the same is happening with the big banks. The big banks have been saying, don't buy this thing, but the bankers in the, in the background have been buying it themselves, either as a company in the background or individually. I can prove this because one of my financial advisors out there, one of my members of the community, he, he was quite honest with me and he said, look, I've bought, I bought crypto and it's been my best performing asset out of everything I've bought and I'm a financial advisor and planner, but I cannot recommend this product to my customers because legally I'm not allowed to. So you have this actual dissonance, cognitive, legal, perceived dissonance where you have one side of the financial market saying, don't buy it, it's bad, you can trust us. But on the other hand, it's like you can see Jerome Powell, the, the chair, Fed, the Fed, uh, chair of the Fed has basically said, we, we can't sustain this anymore. There, there is going to be a time that we can't do this anymore. This is the guy who's in charge of printing the US dollar. He's gone on camera on 60 Minutes and said, it's all got to end sooner or later. We can't keep doing this. So now you have the big players coming out saying, yeah, you know what? We have to actually concede that there's, there's competition. Now, of course, when we give the analogy of, um, you know, the, the banks hating Bitcoin, well, go back to cigarettes as an example. Big companies had to pr protect their company. Now, cigarettes are safe. You can smoke cigarettes, it's good, because they needed to protect their company. Uh, sugar companies, oh yeah, drink Coca-Cola and it, being fat is okay and don't worry about diabetes, use our product. And yet we see the exact same thing with money where the banks say, oh no, you can trust us. We're the ones to be trusted. Don't trust that decentralized, open, neutral, borderless, censorship, hard sound money. Don't trust that one. Trust our unlimited money printing weapon of war, weapon money of crime. Trust that money over yours. And we've seen it, as you mentioned before, we've seen it over and over and over again in history. Now, I will end up in this rant with this point. There is a, when they say, oh, well, you know, Bitcoin is like a tulip, the tulip bubble. Well, it's a very, it shows, everyone, anyone who says that, it just shows how little they know about either the tulip mania or Bitcoin. The, the, primary difference is tulips were unlimited, Bitcoin is limited. So anyone says that Bitcoin is like tulip mania, it's like, yeah, I don't think you really understand either of those concepts. The second component is when we say like the dot-com bubble, I like you using that example. How many internet companies, how many inter websites are there? Over 3 billion at the moment, 3 billion websites. Now, when the internet first came out, a little bit too young to remember it clearly, but I have done my history lessons on what the dot-com bubble was. And basically the dot-com bubble was anything that had dot-com on the end of it was going to make you rich. And initially it was a bit of a mania where it's like, yeah, let's just get anything with a dot-com and make a lot of money. Now, does that mean that the internet was a scam? Nope. Does it mean that no internet companies have value? Well, ask Amazon how they're going for their value. eBay, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, they have unforeseeable amounts of value. But if we relate this to the crypto space now, there are many cryptocurrencies out there that are not going to do anything. They're going to have a little run up and then drop off and that, that will be the little bubble there. But just as there was the fang of internet, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netbook, uh, Netflix, Google, etc., the same is with crypto. You have these top five to 10, potentially 20 coins out there that are going to make unforeseeable amounts of money. Now, NVIDIA, as you spoke about before, is a hardware company that is providing processing power in the background that is required in the physical space to power the digital space. Now, we've had a 40x on that. A 40x in crypto is chump change. We will see 40x over and over again in many of these coins. In many instances, we're going to see a 400x, a 4,000x. Yes, it absolutely happens. And it happens because these market caps in some of the coins are so small but equally the velocity of money is so quick. When the ETFs are operating, it's nine to five, five days a week. 
if you want to get your own crypto, head over to the crypto.land, plug in my own site there, but it's because it's safe and it's me and this is my name and this is my face and so many people get ripped off. It doesn't mean that crypto is a scam. It means that you got scammed by a scammer. So you come over to the crypto.land, you buy your own crypto anytime you want, one o'clock in the morning, Sunday afternoon, whilst you're in bed, whilst you're going for a walk with your dog, you can do it on your phone instantly. And the other thing is you don't need a minimum buy-in of $500. So what does that mean? That means when you're investing in traditional stocks, you typically need a $500 minimum buy-in. You have to be a member of a bank and you have to pay a fee of $10 to $30, who you, depends who you're trading with. Now, not many people have $500. Not everyone has access to a bank, but there are many more people, way more people that have access to a mobile phone connection and access to one cent. And what does that mean? That means now that these financial markets are open to everyone, not just the people with the right paperwork, not just the people with a $500 buy-in, but anyone, including all of those people, anyone can be part of these markets because these markets are truly inclusive truly open to everyone and just like the internet they never sleep and because they never sleep the velocity of these markets is way faster than anything a traditional investor can ever comprehend yeah and i you know a lot of people will say oh how, you know is is this really a fundamentally different notion to the one that we've had for the last you know, a few hundred years. You know, isn't gold and silver the the, the ultimate store store of value, and isn't that where we should be um, holding on to? But you know, and you mentioned <laughs> you mentioned um, a, a certain uh, well known U.S. gold bug who um, basically says, "Look, nothing is." Oh, I've interviewed him several times on my show. Nothing is mm. safe. Therefore, gold is the only anchor point for value, right? And uh, except, of course, that gold doesn't pay anything in terms of a return right and it if you look at the gold it doesn't beat inflation no 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 gold does it? not beat inflation yeah uh whereas um if you bought in at the right time with bitcoin then you could be sitting on a reasonably handsome profit unfortunately of course in the bitcoin world we we know and i see it said in my, some of my surveys there were a number of people who bought into bitcoin when it was you know in the 48 49 50 55 range and if you know, just to put that up, this is the um, this is the uh, Bitcoin US dollar, and you can see. And if you bought in twenty twenty one, you know, sort of over over here ish, um, well, would you hold when it dropped down to um, you know the fifteen sixteen? Uh, a lot of people decided to bail at that point. Um, so it depends a little bit on where where you buy, and um, you know how long you hold. And you know, I, I actually just. <laughs> You might be interested. I had some. I bought some Bitcoin back here uh, in 2020, right, early on. So you know, it's 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 gone up, it's gone down, it's gone up, it's gone down. Um, as a as a sort of a a value anchor, my question to you is: given that chart, um, you know, can can you really hang your hat on the on the value anchor to Bitcoin, or 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 is it really? You know, just like the other stuff we've been talking about, subject to market forces, um, ultimately market forces because there's nothing behind it at all, and it's about a number of people piling in. If enough people pile in, it goes up, and vice versa. But is there anything fundamentally anchored by way of value? Yeah, the, the great question. There's two parts to it. There, it is, <laughs> it is morally, mathematically and probably legally impossible for me to come on here and say, I guarantee that Bitcoin will go up forever. But what I can absolutely guarantee morally, mathematically, legally, and ethically guarantee that fiat is going down. So what I, I don't mean to deflect, but I, I will, I will answer the question in the first instance. Isn't that funny? It's kind of like the Stockholm syndrome. It's like, we know, and, and it cannot be denied. It cannot be denied that the purchasing of power, purchasing power of fiat constantly goes down. I can guarantee, I can bet my entire estate, all of my Bitcoin, all of my gold, everything, that fiat's purchasing power will continue to go down. That is a guarantee. And yet with Bitcoin, what I can also prove is that it is the best performing asset ever. Not this cycle, not this decade, not this century, but in the history of humanity, Bitcoin is the best performing asset ever. And yet we as a people, and don't worry, I've been there. We say, well, 
Now, I, I don't like the look of that best performing asset in the history of humanity. I don't like the fact that no one can control it except for the truth and freedom of the market. What I will prefer is the guaranteed de depreciating purchasing power of fiat. I want the money that constantly goes down. I want the money that's a money of war. I want the money that can be subjected to bail-in and bail-out laws. I want the money that can be counterfeited physically and digitally. I want that money instead of the best performing asset in the history of humanity. And yet we've got 15 years of data to prove where Bitcoin's going. Now, I've asked you to do this before. I wish you could bring up that chart and put it in a log scale because there's too much noise in that chart that you brought up before. It's trying to show a coin that's one cent and $60,000. It's too noisy. You must change the vertical access. access. But what I'll also say when it comes to gold, and Peter Schiff says, and, and many gold busters, I've got gold, I've got no issue with gold. But the truth is, what's the supply of gold? No one knows. We've got about four Olympic sized swimming pools of gold that we've pulled out of the ground. We know Indian women are the biggest holders of gold in the world by an aggregate, but we don't know what the, the supply of gold is. We don't know if we're going to be able to pull gold out of the bottom of the Grand Canyon or at the bottom of the deepest ocean. We don't know if a comet's going to hit us and there's going to be gold on it. We don't know if environmental laws are going to change where we do know where there's gold, but we don't dig up the ground because it's got a rainforest above it. Well, maybe that will change. So we know that we don't know what the supply of gold is, but we do know what the supply of Bitcoin is. We do know that more of it can't be created. And I know some people say, well, I could make another Bitcoin. Yeah, you could. You could make a Bitcoin back, a Bitcoin gold, a Bitcoin diamond, a Bitcoin cash, a Bitcoin SV. And guess what? They've all been done and they've all failed. All of them. There is only one Bitcoin. And that one Bitcoin is called Bitcoin. We know what the supply is. Everyone can access it, but no one can control it. And that's what's so powerful and such a hard concept to explain. If we went back, you know, 100 years ago and we said, hey, great, great grandma, there's going to be this thing called the internet. And she'll say, well, what's the internet? And you have to go right back and say, well, there's going to be things called a computer. And you say, well, what's a computer? And you say, well, it's, it's going to have a thing that's called a screen. And she's going to say, what's a screen? So really, when you think about the concept of the computer, of what we're doing now, think of all the technologies. In fact, you'd even have to go back and say, well, it's going to come in a plastic casing. And you say, well, what's plastic? It's going to have microchips. Like, well, what's microchips? And you say, well, it's going to need electricity to run it. And she's going to say, this guy is crazy. He's talking about screens, plastic, microchips, internet, electricity. This guy is crazy. Yet this is how we do everything today. So now when we move from the old paradigm of the old broken centralized money on one ledger where one person controls it or one entity controls it, when we go onto a decentralized ledger, we're like, what does that mean? And, and it's okay. One of my degrees is economics. And I say that not to say, look at me, but I, with a degree in economics, I didn't grasp this technology at first. People think I come in, those who aren't in my community, they think I'm shilling this thing that you buy low, sell high. No, that's a consequence of this technology. The consequence of this technology is that a lot of millionaires are going to be made. A consequence of this technology is a lot of war is going to come to an end. A consequence of this technology is that we now have a new borderless sound censorship, open money for everyone. And we've never had that before. So just as I'm trying to teach grandma, great, great grandma of, of the past, that this is what the computer and the internet is. Before I can tell her what a computer and the internet is, I have to actually explain to her what electricity is, what a computer screen is, what plastics are, what a microchip is, what a network is, what telecommunications is. All of that comes together to create what we're doing right now, communication on the internet of information. But now we have a new internet. We now have an internet of value. And that internet of value is something that people simply cannot grasp. Not at first, but they can. They will come around. They think that digital money is what I use my fiat when I tap and pay. No, that's not digital money. That's still fiat. I'm just using a digital interface. A true digital money is a scarce digital asset. But of course, because we're so limited with Web2 understanding, Web2, we say, well, hang on, if it's a digital thing, I can just go copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. Yes, you can on something that is not a digital, decentralized, hard, scarce money such as Bitcoin. But when we have limited understanding of the world around us, we say, well, no, I can just copy and paste an image. Therefore, I can copy and paste a Bitcoin. Of course you can't. One of the greatest technologies about Bitcoin was overcoming the double spend rule, which is the copy paste that I'm explaining. The second component of that is a decentralized ledger. That is, I have the ledger, you have the ledger, everyone has the ledger. 
But in our old paradigm of thinking, it's like, no, 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 just the bank has the ledger or just the government has the ledger. That's prehistoric, old, broken, corrupt money thinking. The new money, the internet of value, is in fact everyone has the ledger. And if anyone tries to compromise or break that ledger, they're kicked out of the network. It's truly remarkable how it works. I'll close off this rant with understanding what Web3 is, because you spoke about artificial intelligence and it's important to understand it. Web1 was essentially read. That is, you go onto a site and you could see something. Web2 is what we've been using for over a decade, where we can interact with the computer. We can open a Facebook page and put pictures on it. We can put uh, go into an email and send stuff to stuff uh, to other people. We can order online. We can fill in application forms. Web2 is ba basically being able to read and write. Web3 is where we're going now. This is where Web3 changes everything. Just as Web2 is a centralized database of information, the same as a centralized database of money, money is kind of a centralized database of money. The Internet of Web2 is a centralized database of information, but Web3 is leveraging off the power of something such as Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies where we decentralize that information. Now, what does that mean? That means when you post something on Facebook, as an example, Instead of Mark Zuckerberg and Meta owning that information that they can look at, that they can block, that they can stop, that they can seize, that they can do anything that they want with your information, that you could have an Optus hack, that you could leak it out into the dark web. With Web3, you own the information. You are the information. So imagine an internet, even if you don't like crypto, the foundation of Web3 is cryptographic technology. And the foundation of Web3 is just as with Bitcoin, no one can control it. With the internet of Web3, no one can control that as well. You make a post, it's your post. You release information onto the internet, that's your information. Now, some people might be able to send it around, but unlike Facebook and the centralized databases of Google and Facebook and Netflix, we now have a technology where we can decentralize this information. The next layer where it's moving so quickly, and these things are moving very quickly, very quickly indeed. So if it's all overwhelming, start simple. Just understand what decentralized money means. Understand what Bitcoin is, because the next iteration of the internet isn't just the Web3 component, it's Web3 with artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is moving so quickly that we now have the ability to have a fake me. You, you don't even know this is me. This could be the information that someone else has taken from me. We're, we're already there. Now, of course, there's a few little glitches there, but we can see that it's, it's happened with Joe Rogan, it's happened with Donald Trump, it's happened with uh, President Biden, where artificial intelligence has taken the voice, the style, the accent, the face, and they've made it a digital video of that person. A little bit clunky at first, but so were computer games when we first created them. Now computer games are becoming very realistic. When we go to artificial intelligence built on the power of decentralized systems and the blockchain, my friend, these things are moving so quickly, we genuinely don't have much time. And if you don't grasp this comp uh, technology, you're going to be left behind. Yeah. And I just want to pick you up on one thing. You, you, you said, sure. you said, show me the log, the, the log rather than the linear scale, right? And I can do that. There you go. Now, my, my question is, why does changing the picture from log to linear change the argument because surely the truth is that it's gone up it's gone down it's gone up it's gone down it's gone up <laughs> it doesn't actually reflect um, a change in volatility it may change the scale but um does it really make a difference showing it log versus linear yeah it does and and i respect entirely that if you're not used to crypto you're not used to looking these at these charts so i've been investing my entire adult life and i never knew a log chart until i got into crypto and the answer to it is very simple in your previous when you're in your linear chart when you don't have log logarithmic in the background the vertical axis is trying to capture so now you're in non-log right yep so and if you go even further back, like if you go to like 2000, uh, no, you're in 2019, that's good. But if you could go further back to like 2009, are you able, okay, that's better. Okay. What, what this chart is trying to show you, it's trying to capture in an image in what, what have we got, like 10 centimeters of a vertical axis. Yep. That 10 centimeter axis is trying to show you a price of one thousandth of a cent versus $70,000. 
And that creates too much noise in the chart. And that's why it looks so violent. It looks so violent because it's volatile, but I like to say violent because it is it's like a wild ride. It's capturing a, a price that is less than a cent and $60,000. And when you've got a vertical axis of 10 centimeters, it's too noisy. So when you change it to log, what that does is it simply changes the difference between each increment on the left hand side and it's it, it gets rid of a lot of the noise I, I call it noise it gets rid of the noise and it says well look we're going in the chart at 325 dollars so your bottom there is starting at about 205 dollars and this information comes in at 325 and then it tracks up all the way up to fifty six thousand dollars so what's actually happening there is it it by an increment typically of 10 it changes the vertical axis between each data point by an increment of 10. So, so why do we do that? We do that because, and, and hang on, I'll go back a step. Why don't we do this in other charts? We don't do this in other charts because if you look at gold as an example, gold moves from $1,000 in 20 years to $1,600. I only have to show a movement of $600 in a 10 centimeter axis. I can do that very, very easily. There you go, there's your gold. So look at your axis there. What what's the? I, I just can't quite see it there. What's your bottom reading there? As so it's, your top it's, one? it's just over um, uh, one thousand to two hundred and four. So, so, so this is a log. If I go a linear, hardly any, virtually hardly no any difference. Yeah. So why isn't there? So I'm glad you did that. So go back to log and then go to linear, just so the viewers can see it flick between. Okay. Why so, is there almost no movement there? The reason why there's almost no movement is because all that chart is capturing is a difference of a thousand dollars, and that's easy to do. To capture it, uh, it's not even a thousand dollars. It's oh yeah, it's a thousand dollars. So from one thousand and five dollars to two thousand and forty bucks, mm. it's capturing a difference, a price move of a thousand dollars. But if you want to somehow map out a price difference of a tenth of a cent to seventy thousand dollars, down to ten thousand dollars, down to up to fifty thousand dollars it's too noisy you and I, i'm not saying this is a selling point I'm, I'm legitimately saying that all of us in the crypto land we have to do this because the price movements are simply too much so what do we do we say we'll go to a log chart so we can get rid of the noise and then we get to a log chart we can actually see it, it's just tracking up and to the right absolutely there's pullbacks but guess what there's pullbacks in houses there's pullbacks in gold there's pullbacks in everything but because these markets move so much faster and further, and the reason why they move faster is because it's digital and it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Gold markets aren't open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so they're not open as long. But equally, why do they move further? They move further because their market caps are smaller. When you've got a market cap of a dollar, which Bitcoin was at one stage, and then you go from $1 to $2, you've actually got a 100% increase. But when you've got a market cap of a trillion dollars, which is where Bitcoin is now, you're actually going to see we're not going to need linear for the as correction logarithmic for the next five to 10 years because the, the movements won't be so violent. Because when we go from a one trillion dollar market cap to a two trillion dollar market cap, yes, it's a one trillion dollar movement, but as a percentage, it's only a hundred percent movement. If we take all data, we're looking at a one million percent movement. So how do you capture a 1 million percent movement on a chart? You've got to change the vertical axis. This is not unique to crypto in the sense that many other um, systems use this type of charting. It's just that it's new to the financial system because we're not used to 1 million percent movements in any asset, a million percent more than. <laughs> Well, let me show you this. This is NVIDIA on the log scale, <laughs> right? Okay. And yeah. it goes from 3.5 uh, down there to uh, 790. So, yeah, I, I have to say um, I'm struggling a bit to, uh, other than the, the, the graphic representation of, of something, um, it doesn't, to me, connote anything particularly important. Um, it's still very volatile. And uh, I don't think the volatility is going to go away, by the way. Um there's also an interesting argument. To what extent is is um, Bitcoin tracking the rise in the broader markets? Because the stock stock markets are um, you know all time highs as well. So uh, and, and if you if you actually look over recent history, there's quite a strong correlation between movements in um, in Bitcoin and movements in the uh, the broader markets as well. So um, not as a percentage movement. I, I know what you're saying, but I, I apologize for interrupting, but I, hmm. I understand the question in the sense that 
we go back to the housing example. You know, has your housing really gone up uh, from five hundred thousand to eight hundred thousand dollars? Well, on paper it has, and the same is with stocks. Has your stocks really gone up from fifty cents per stock to eighty cents per stock? Well, on paper it has, but as a percentage compared to what Bitcoin's doing, it's nowhere near it. So you might say, you know, my house went from over twenty years, my house went or ten years, my house went from five hundred thousand to to a million dollars. Yeah, I've made a hundred percent. Well, of course you haven't because of your rates and your body corporate and your legal fees and all that. But that aside, let's say that we, there was no rates, there was no land tax, there was no insurance, there was there was no uh, recarpeting, there was nothing. It was just this magical house that you could move anywhere in the world, deal with no regulations, uh, couldn't be confiscated by anyone, couldn't be burnt by anyone, and it was just this perfect house that didn't do anything except remained secure and went up in value. Well, to go from 500,000 to a million dollars, you say I've doubled my money, but of course, as we mentioned before, you haven't really because they printed lots of money. So when you apply that same paradigm to stocks, you actually start to see the same thing is happening with stocks. So you must beat the hurdle rate. The hurdle rate, of course, is whatever they printed for inflation. But equally, when you own a property, you must beat the hurdle rate of your rates and your land tax and your insurance and your body corporate and the new carpets. If you want to make profits on that, sure, you can have a depreciation schedule, but that's for another argument. You've got to beat that hurdle rate. And the same is with stocks. You must beat the hurdle rate of inflation. Now, the government will tell you that inflation is 5 to 6%. You and I both know that is an absolute lie. The real rate of inflation, the real rate is more like 20%. And I can yep. prove it. Your energy's gone up 20%, your food's gone up at 20%, your cost of living everywhere's gone up at 20%. But what they do is they say, well, no, in the CPI basket this week or this year, your Netflix didn't go up 20%, that only went up 4%, and your phone bill stayed is equal because it didn't move anywhere. So our, our CPI basket this year, yeah, everything's only gone up 5%. It's like, yeah, but you didn't do cars or housing and fuel and interest rates. Uh, think about this. If they incorporated interest rates into the inflation rate, and on, on the surface, you say, well, don't be stupid. You can't do that. Well, of course you can, because the cost of a house when you've got a mortgage, that's kind of like your big, biggest expense. But they don't put the interest rate into the inflation rate, because if they did, <laughs> inflation would be over 100%, because we've gone from one of my properties, it was 1.79%, and then it went to 6%. So the cost for that money has almost tripled. But that's not the inflation basket. And you say, well, that doesn't count. Of course it counts. That's real money. So a, a bit of a rant, I realize. But you, you must look at the percentage gains, not so much that, yeah, the stocks went up. Well, so did the houses. The stocks went up and the houses went up. But the, the crypto, if you look at Bitcoin or some of the altcoins, they went way higher than the rest of the market. Way, way, way higher. They beat every inflation rate, every hurdle rate, and they're, they're not stopping anytime soon. Absolutely. Well, let's move the conversation forward. There were a few sort of more uh, what I call meat and potato questions that, that came into the chat a little while ago. Um, Cookie Boy, for example, um, asked this question. Let's put it up on the screen for you. Um, when you sell crypto, what is the CGT that's charged? Because, of course, there's a whole question of when you when you buy and sell crypto, how that is actually accounted for. And, of course, the ATO has an interest in this as well. So how does that yeah. work? Easy uh, and great question. And I appreciate it. So first of all, uh, tax was uh, sorry, crypto was legitimised when the Australian Taxation Office started taxing it. You don't tax crime; you stop crime and you put the criminals in jail. So if if anyone says, "Oh, Bitcoin's illegal," well, no, I can assure you, the Australian Taxation Office absolutely taxes crypto, not because it's illegal, but because it's a real asset. Noting I'm not a tax accountant or financial advisor, I have to say that as a disclaimer because it's, it's illegal for me to give you tax or financial advice, but I, I can tell you how it works metaphorically or actually, and then you go check with your accountant and get them to confirm what I'm telling you. It's no different to property. If I buy the asset and keep it for more than 12 months, I pay tax on half of those capital gains. If I keep the asset for less than 12 months, I pay tax on all of those gains. So as a very simple example, if I buy Bitcoin, an amount of Bitcoin, doesn't have to be a Bitcoin, but if I buy $100,000 worth of Bitcoin and I keep it for six months and it goes up to $200,000, I've just made a $100,000 profit in less than a year. I have to pay a capital gains tax on all of that $100,000 profit. So essentially, if I'm in the top bracket and keeping things very simple, half of that money, half of that profit goes to the tax man. But if I kept uh, sorry, that Bitcoin, Adam, so that's assuming you sold, right? 
you Abs- don't, uh, yeah, very good point. It, it's it's so it's not yes. on the paper profit; it's on the actual realized gain. Realized gains at the correct. point if you were disposable. That's really important. Very good point. And, and you know, just on that, before I digress, um, there was a law that was going to be put in America. Is it horrific? It didn't go through because if they did in America, they do it here. They were going to put a tax on unrealized gains, not just for crypto, but for property. So you can think of this example. It's, no, it's really no different to buying a house or, or gold or stocks. It's, it's actually exactly the same. So I keep the asset for more than 12 months in this example. I've made a $100,000 profit. I press sell. I've now got $200,000 in my bank account. So $100,000 in my original investment, that cancels out. I've got $100,000 profit. Because I've held the asset for more than 12 months, I now pay a capital gains tax on only $50,000 of the profit. So in this example, if I'm in the top tax bracket, keeping things very simple at 50% tax at the top, very simple, I then give $25,000 to the tax man. So a big rant to say, if you make $100,000 profit or, or any profit, we're just keeping the number simple, you pay a CGT, once you press sell, on all the profits if it's less than 12 months, or if you've held it for less than uh, more than 12 months, you only pay a CGT on half of those profits. So yeah, it, it's pretty much the same as property and the same as stocks. I, I think it's an old outdated law. I, I think, you know, <laughs> the velocity of money moves so quickly now. Stop bringing us to a halt where you have to wait, hold for something for 12 months. It, it's snail time. This law was made, you know, a, a century, I don't know when, but decades ago, over a century ago in the olden day markets, we now have a new digital market, allow the velocity of money to do what money does. And yes, the tax man will take an initial hit, but because there'll be so much more trading occurring, they'll be taking more cuts of more profits as opposed to less cuts or bigger cuts of less profits, if that makes sense. And I will make the point that um, in corporate land, of course, where there are traders actively um, trading in the marketplace, they can offset losses and gains. Uh, and so they can often net out some some of those potential you tax can, liability. That is, yeah, you you can do that as a, an individual investor as well. Uh, yeah. Sometimes we call it tax harvesting. So some people will actually sell a lot just before a tax time yeah. to um, harvest those losses. But I've heard, of course, the tax man realizes, hey, we're getting ahead there, so they're going to put in a law to stop that. Yeah. And by the way, if um if your business is trading. So say you are your whole company is trading, the law that I just described doesn't apply to sure. you. There's a different set of laws yeah. to you. Yeah, absolutely, uh, good point. Now, the, another question that uh, that came up was, and it, it came up actually in a couple of questions that I received before the show as well as on the show. The halving, you know, you mentioned the halving. Um, it's happening relatively soon now. Um, what's traditionally been the impact of the halving of Bitcoin? on its price trajectory. And um, I've got the chart if you want me to put it up again. Uh, it triples the price within 12 months. T- typically, it triples the price within 12 months. Very basic and simplistic. So we talk about diminishing returns in Bitcoin. That is in each cycle, mm. the percentage returns become less. So if we go all the way back, you know, in the first halving, you're, you're making 100x and then 50x, then 25x. Um, but this time, so you, you might look at that the peak of 2022. So if you, you hover above 2022, that peak up there, my price, my, my company's price estimates is at a, at a low end. And of course, this is just an estimate, so you can't quote me on it, but this is my name. This is my face. So I put it on camera. Mm-hmm. You're going to see a minimum, and you're looking at Australian dollars. I, I know you're in US dollars. I'm there. in US dollars. You're going yeah. to, yeah, you're going to see a, at least, at least 147,000 US dollar Bitcoin, at least. Some trajections um, and forecasts have it at a quarter of a million to half a million, uh, but I want to be uh, reasonable here. Based on everything that's happening around us, based on history, based on the money coming into the markets, based on inflation, based on interest rates and ETFs, 147,000 US dollars is a very conservative estimate for where Bitcoin is going to go in the next 500 days. Very conservative estimate. <laughs> yeah. And that's not financial advice. That's not. That's just a, you know, a sense of. That's why I asked the history question, right? Because you know, history rhymes. And in recent yeah, uh, recent halvings, yeah, in recent halvings, there's been um, a considerable spike up, followed by the way by a considerable decline subsequent. Yep. 
Yeah, and, all, all markets move in cycles. Yeah. All markets. The, the uh, difference between the crypto markets and other markets is that we can see everything so much clearer. We can feel it, the velocity, the speed, the reach. It, it's digital. It moves so quickly. Now, some people, they scare, they're scared of it. They say, well, you know, it's too volatile. Well, if you want performance, you need volatility. And, and in fact, that's what, when you think about, you know, you're trading gold and you move 10 points in a day, you've done all this research, you've done all your TA and you've moved 10 points, you know, like what a waste. So you have to actually put leverage on that position to really get a return on that. Crypto moves so far and fast, you actually don't need that leverage. Now you can put leverage on it if you want. I don't recommend that. That's crazy, but people do. And they make millions of dollars in a very short time. Equally, they can get wrecked in an even shorter time. <laughs> So just play, you know, the safest way is just DCA, just dollar cost average every week. So you and I have been working together for five years and we spoke off camera about this. The reality is if you, and I can do the calculations now, but if, if anyone from when we first met had been putting $10 a week into Bitcoin every week, so not, not, not every um, cycle, but just every week, you just put $10 into Bitcoin You'd be sitting on a fortune. I can do it now if, if you want to take over chatting. I can actually <laughs> work out the exact numbers for yeah, you. Yeah. No. $10 weekly for five years. Yeah. You go for it and do the calculation. Let, let me make a, 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 a couple of points. Um, the reason that I, I went into crypto as early as I did was because I wanted to understand because I felt that this was an important thing to try and get my head around. And I don't know how successful I've been in terms of trying to understand it, because, of course, I came from the traditional finance sector and I could see very similar trends in crypto land to the broader financial system. The speculators piling in, um, persuading other people to, to, you know, to, to come in and then effectively jump out and, uh, you know, the volatility allowed people, particularly traders, to, to make money. But I also felt, felt that there was something fundamentally important here in terms of the idea of it being decentralised and therefore not controlled by central banks and central bankers. And as was discussed earlier, I was very frustrated by central banks and the way they just uh, blew up the, you know, the balance sheets of their central banks and government debt. And I've had a problem with, with massive amounts of um, debt globally for a long, long time and feel that this is destabilising the global economy, but it is also putting huge imposts on future generations in terms of the pile of debts that, like it or not, some in some way, it'll either go boom or it'll have to get paid off, which puts a huge impost then on, on, on where public spending can actually go. So, so I started quite early. And I also became very interested in this concept of decentralised finance. In other words, alternative finance systems and models that didn't rely on central banks and, and, and banks themselves. And if you overlay that with digital as well, you know, you could start to see that there was some interesting DNA here. Now, I have no idea how this is going to play out, but that's why I got into under, trying to understand it. And our conversations over recent years have actually helped to sort of, you know, build out my understanding and, uh, you know, help, help perhaps some people in my community to, to get their head around this stuff in the context of this booming debt bubble <laughs> in, in the real world, right? So now that's the sort of the bit, of, bit of the context. Have you done the calc? Yeah, I have. And before I give it to you, I, I commend you for what you've done because, you know, I, my, our audiences are very different. Hmm. And many of your viewers have come over to my channel. And I think some of my viewers have gone over to your channel. And we actually need each other. We need each other because I call you a traditional investor and I call myself well, maybe a future investor. I don't really know what I call myself, but in any case, maybe a crypto enthusiast. But the, the reality is you have set a precedent for your viewers to say, well, hang on, we're so like, look at that funny money, but it's like, well, let, let, let's actually find out what it is. Let's seek the truth first. And I would actually suggest, unless you've put 100 hours into researching Bitcoin, that might sound a lot, but I've put well over that. And that's on top of an economics degree and on top of a my entire adulthood uh, investing on the traditional stock exchange unless you put 100 hours into bitcoin you truly don't get it you really don't get it and you might to everyone out there you say well i'm not going to put 100 hours in okay cool but instead of just putting five hours into bitcoin bad just get the other side just say well what's the advantage of bitcoin why is half a billion dollars going into it a week why is it at the best performing asset in history why is it the most secure um, payment system that we've ever had in the history of humanity what does a decentralized ledger mean and 
And anyone who genuinely and openly finds the answers to these questions, it's impossible to hate Bitcoin. It's impossible because it's like, oh, okay, well, no one controls it. Everyone can be part of it. And what you did, which was very good besides trying to learn about it, is you test drove it. So when I test drive um, stocks, as an example, I need a $500 minimum buy-in. Most people who come to me and like, oh, I don't know about this crypto thing, like in my personal life, I say, try it with a dollar. And, and if I have cash in my pocket, which is very rare, I pull out a dollar and I say, here's a dollar. You can have it. Try it. And like, oh, I'm not going to do that. So well, try it with 10 cents. Because remember, you can test drive these markets with one cent. You can't do that in stocks. You can test drive these markets with a tenth of a cent. You're like, well, how do you do that? It's digital money. You can test drive these markets with a cent. And I would suggest, you know, we, we have this evolution of money. And to say, well, I'm not going to put a cent, one cent into these markets because Bitcoin bad. It's like, man. You're really, you're missing out. But anyway, if you'd put $10 a week into these markets for the last five years, you would have put a total of $2,610 in and you would now be sitting on just under $4,000. So essentially you would have made 50% in the last five years. Now that includes, now remember, we are at a market bottom. We're not at a market top. We have pulled back from where we are. But to put things in perspective, let's say you went nine years. So the, the technology has been around for 15 years. But let's say just for the nine years, you put $10 a week in. Just, you didn't think about it. Any high, any low, every week, dollar cost average. You would have invested a total of $4,700 a week. But right now, you'd be sitting on $72,000. So that's 1,435%. Now, to keep things all equal, so 1,435% over nine years. But as I mentioned, you and I have been together for five years. Mm. So any of the viewers who have just put in $10 a week, you're up 50% before the bull run's about to kick off. So I'm, I'm calculating it to today. But I would actually, in, in all legitimacy, we'll say, could we at least calculate it to the next cycle top? And we don't know the exact top, but I could at least say after the halving. We're not even at the halving yet, and you've made 50% on your money. I can't find any better performing asset with, a, you know, with an outlier of a stock, but I'm only talking about Bitcoin. Because remember, there are of the legitimate coins, there are 22,000 other coins to invest in. Now, I've just done a, a forecast on, on the biggest and safest coin, the lowest risk, lowest return coin in the last five years. There are other coins out there that you could have made 10,000x. There are other coins that I have made 10,000x. You might say, well, that's impossible. No, no, I did it. And, and even if you don't get the 10,000x, I've made 500x, I've made 1,000x, I've made 50x. I'm, I'm just making so much money here. And this isn't about yay me. It's about, hey, what's going on here? There's the option there. I don't have to put $100,000 in. I can put a dollar in. And I'd actually end this rant with this, Martin. Remember, it's not binary. You don't have to go all in on crypto. One of the things I find quite interesting is people are like, oh, Bitcoin's too much. It's, it's you know, 56,000 US dollars. I'm like, well, you don't have to get a full one. It's digital. Put a dollar in. Oh, I'm not going to put a dollar in because I'm not going to make any money. And it's like, well, hang on a second. So you don't want to put too much in. You don't want to put too little in. Well, put a medium in. Oh, I'm not putting $30,000 in. It's like, but there's, there's like 22,000 coins out there. Try it with a dollar. See what happens. It's particularly if you're already investing in the stock exchange and it's a $500 minimum buy-in, why wouldn't you try a $0.05 cent minimum buy-in or a $0.01 cent minimum buy-in, which is what you did. You tested the markets. And the best performing asset that I've got, because it's not binary, it's not just crypto or just houses. It's not just Bitcoin or Ethereum. It's all of it. I have houses, I have gold, I have stocks, I have superannuation funds, and I have crypto. But the best performing asset I've had in my entire life, out of, any, out of all of them combined, multiple times over, is crypto. And it, it's, it's only just beginning. So I didn't sell my property portfolio to get into crypto. I didn't liquidate all my stocks. I didn't get rid of all my gold. I had both. But unlike when I get into a property market, I typically need half a million dollars. And you might say, well, I can leverage up. Sure, I, yeah, I can have a deposit of 10 to 20% for a million dollar house of $200,000 or $100,000 if it's a $500,000 house. Sure, but I still need $100,000 and I need to make future payments on that and I need to worry about tenants. But with crypto, I can just throw 10 cents into the market and then just see what happens. I don't need rates. I don't, need, I don't have to pay rates or insurance. I don't have to worry about landlords. I don't have to worry about replacing carpets. I don't have to worry about someone stealing it. It's just there. So we're running out of time. I, I say this as to my fellow Australians. I, I genuinely mean this. This is my name. This is my face. This is what I commit most of my life to right now. 
you, you don't have much time. The financial system is about to collapse. And we are on the life raft saying, there's room here. Your entry fee to come here is one cent if you just want to try it. And as the, the ship of fiat sinks to the bottom of the ocean, and everyone is drowning in debt and drowning in inflation and in drowning in too expensive everything. And we're like, hey, hop on board. Everyone's welcome here. And it's like, nah, I'm staying with the sinking ship of fear. And it's like, some people can't be helped. They, they can't be helped. I've given service to this country in uniform. I thought that was helping. I don't think it really did much. I genuinely feel I can give more service to this country, to this world by saying, hey, there's now an alternative. And I've joked with you about this before, but I'm going to joke it about again because you've got a great sense of humor. And I always think about the comment, and I've called you on it before, but I'm going to call you on you again. <laughs> Here you go. One of my subs during one of our interviews years ago said, so let me get this straight. Martin North wants a money that looks like Bitcoin, acts like Bitcoin, is decentralized like Bitcoin, and is scarce like Bitcoin, but is not Bitcoin. <laughs> and I always think about that. Now, you've come around, and I don't think you stand by that statement. But when I, what I put out to the viewers out there, I am genuinely open to any alternative to fiat that is fair. And I put it out there. I say, hey, if you can find me something that's better than an unlimited printing mo printed money that one centralized body controls, whoever they may be, I'm open. Like, give it to me. I want to see it. But the only option we have at the moment is Bitcoin. And a CBDC is not a cryptocurrency. A CBDC is a digital fiat. A CBDC is tyranny. And we, whether we like crypto or not, we both sides of the fence, whether you love fiat or love crypto or you're somewhere in between, everyone must come together and say, we must stop a CBDC at all costs. Because the second we have a CBDC, we are truly under tyranny and we have lost all freedom of any description. Well, just uh, on that, I wanted to make the point that uh, central banks and central bankers, of course, want to keep the system as it currently is because that's the system that they've created and are, are, and are controlling. So, you know, whether it's a good, a good thing for the general populace or um, economists generally is a whole different debate. In recent times, we've seen an attempt by Jim Chalmers to remove the parliament's ability to be able to actually intercept the Reserve Bank in its decisions. There's actually, there was actually an inquiry last week, which was, um, I made a show about it. Go check it out uh, if you want to look at it I, in half an hour. Because it was interesting, the only people who actually wanted to give that uh, power away was Jim Chalmers and the economists and the um, people connected with the, you know, the, the global financial system through the central banks. Everybody else said, hang on a moment, we're giving up democracy. You know, we're actually yep. um, meaning that now the central bank can do anything it likes and there's no check and balance. So, you know, it, it's a question, of, a question of democracy. And again, with central bank digital currencies, which is still very much being tested in multiple countries around the world, including in Australia and other places too, um, if you, it, it's closing the circle because basically what it means is that you, you know, society will be trapped within a digital system. And if you are, a, you know, if you've got the right credit score and if you've got the right social score, you can transact. But if you haven't, they can turn you off, and they can also control the depreciation of the of the value of money and do all sorts of things. And it's interesting that um, uh, Jerome Powell some time ago said that um, central bank digital currencies provide additional financial tools to central bankers. Well, I don't want to give them any more <laughs> tools. They've stuffed up enough already with what they've been doing. Yeah. So to my mind, um, you know, there are very worrying signs there of central bankers getting desperate. As you said earlier on, you know, he, he said, well, at some point this is going to go pop. Well, yeah, they're going to continue to sort of keep that bubbling along for as long as possible. So if there is an alternative strategy that actually leads us to a different outcome, I'm interested. I have to say that I still think there are significant risks attached to, you know, particularly Bitcoin because it's becoming, um, you know, driven significantly by the financial system and the old rules of the financial system are being imposed on crypto through the ETFs and other things. I think that's a problem because effectively those uh, large organizations are effectively milking the um, Bitcoin story, it seems to me, and are doing precisely what they did previously in other asset classes, be it gold, be it uh, silver, be it um, you know stock markets or bonds. So that's a problem. But 
there's something which is naggingly interesting to me about this story of the digital decentralized alternative. And I guess one of the, my other observations, Adam, as we come towards the end of the show, is the idea ultimately is you don't actually want to compare the value of Bitcoin against the fiats, right? The Bitcoin story should be a self-contained story about the use of Bitcoin, which ultimately then means you need to be able to actually be able to transact in Bitcoin and, and use Bitcoin instead of fiat. Now, we haven't got there yet, but is that where the story takes us? Yeah, so you can compare Bitcoin to anything. So that chart that I showed you, I compared it to a house. So, and we do transact in Bitcoin. For example, in my company, if you want to employ me, you pay me in Bitcoin or we don't do business. Now, that, that's my, demogra my um, democratic freedom to choose what you pay me in. Now, if a government says, Adam, you can't accept Bitcoin because tax and terrorism. I said, well, hang on, I can show you that it's Bitcoin and I can pay my fair share of tax and I can show you I'm not a terrorist. Why can't I choose Bitcoin? Now, I practice what I preach and my private clients out there will tell you, yeah, we, we pay Adam in Bitcoin. So absolutely, I choose to be paid in Bitcoin. And what's, what has happened as a result? Well, from the years of private consult consultation that I've provided, all that money that I've earned has gone up in value. Had I taken fiat, all of that money I've earned would have gone down in value. So the free market says, do I, what do I want to pay in? So the, a, a tyrannistic, if that's such a word, a market of tyranny or dictatorship <laughs> would say, English is fun, they would say, no, you have to use our money or we'll put you in jail. Well, that's not freedom, that's tyranny. So when, when I say you work with the cryptoland.com, if you want to, sorry, the crypto.land, and if you want to work with me, you've got to pay me in Bitcoin or we have no business. Now, if they say, well, I'm going to pay you in Bitcoin, it's like, oh, okay, fine. But it's the same as I don't accept the US dollar and I don't accept rupees, but I don't also accept the US Australian dollar. I choose to accept Bitcoin. So you can compare Bitcoin to whatever you want. And the graph I brought up tonight was showing Bitcoin compared to houses, but I can compare Bitcoin to, and there was a site that did this, um, Volturo. They actually did the price of Bitcoin in ounces of gold. And you can actually see over time, it's the same thing. One Bitcoin can buy way more gold now than what it could buy in the past. The only reason why we go back to the US dollar or any dollar is because that's what we're most familiar with. That's what we've been brought up with. Everyone kind of kind of understands what a value of a dollar is today because they know how much they can buy. Now, Bitcoin at the moment is 56,000 US dollars. Well, what could I buy with 56,000 US dollars? Well, I could probably buy a brand new three series BMW. And I know that. But if you said, oh, we could buy, I don't know, 15 bars of gold, I'd be like, oh, I can't really relate to that. Or you could buy a half of a house. You can, I can't really relate to that. So, you know, what is the anchor point? I, I actually say when we move into the future, maybe it'll be bottles of oil, uh, bottles of water or barrels of oil. Maybe we'll be doing the anchor point is something that is more tangible. I think bottles of water is a good one. But again, a bottle of water here where I've got water on tap is worth a, a lot less than a bottle of water in the desert when I'm dying. So even then, even if we take money out of the equation, different currencies in different places have different value at different times to different people. For example, uh, I'm not really into Louis Vuitton man bag crap. But for other people, they, they would do anything for a Louis Vuitton man bag. But if someone said... Hey, Adam, do you want half a Bitcoin or two Louis Vuitton man bags? I'd be like, give me the Bitcoin. But I know for a fact, other people would say, no, give me the, give me the man bag. They would, they would want that bag. So my, my whole premise here is that we should be free to choose. We should absolutely be free to choose which money we use. And if we allow a CBDC to come in, we're all in a world of hurt, my friend. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, we're doing all we can to uh, try and raise the awareness of uh, the questions around uh, what central banks are doing and um, the you know, potential tyranny that, that, that follows. So um, this is... You know, can, I, um, could I, oh. can I just do a quick thought experiment with you? Um, Go on. I know normally it's weird to do a counter interview, but I, I, you've been on my channel and I've interviewed you, but I deeply respect your opinion. So I'm just going to ask you two questions about money. And that they're binary questions. So Martin North now has, is, we're going to philosophy. You can make a money of your choice. Just two questions and they're binary. One, should the money supply be limited or unlimited? I think it should be limited because if it's unlimited, then you go on creating more and more and more of it and the value declines and that ultimately goes bust. 
Absolutely. And I think we can all kind of agree with that. So we, we don't have that with fear. We have the opposite yep. of that. Correct. Then the second part would be, should the ledger, and we, we know that money is on a ledger, whether it's on a book in a bank or somewhere, should the ledger be held by one person or one entity or by everyone? Should it be centralized in one body or should it be a, a, um, available to everyone? Well, clearly, if you only have one version of the ledger, then they always risk it, it could be corrupted or it could actually be destroyed, which means then you've got no record. Whereas if it's actually um, in, in, in you know, multiple places and it's replicated, then the chances of it actually being um, destroyed or even corrupted diminishes. So you'd think that multiple points rather than one would be better. Exactly. So I promised it would only be two questions, but I, I give you those two questions because whatever money we have, those are the two most important questions. Should the money be unlimited or scarce? And we all agree, well, it should be scarce, therefore limited. And then the second part is, well, who controls that? Because we talk about the ledger. And as you said, if one person holds it, they can corrupt it, lose it or break it. So we must have everyone hold the ledger. Now, everything else is smoke and mirrors that would take hundreds of hours to explain. Ultimately, if we only finish off tonight with this key principle, the key principle to what we've just discussed is those two facts. The fact is that Bitcoin is scarce and everyone holds a ledger. It's not perfect and it can't be perfect. No one's perfect. Nothing will be perfect. Perfection doesn't exist. But as long as we start with the money that is scarce in its supply, and everyone can see the ledger, and no one can corrupt the ledger, then we're good to go. And that's where we are with Bitcoin. Yep. Well, um, as a very nice way to finish off the show. Thank you very much for that. If people want to get more information, uh, where's the best place for them to go? Thank you for asking. So um, I, I encourage everyone not to get scammed out there. Crypto is not a scam. Scammers are the scam. So if you want to protect yourself, come over to the crypto.land. That's www.thecrypto.land. It's a safe, simple, secure site that is run, run and owned by my company. Everything on there is safe. I use it. I endorse it. That's where you start if, if you want to come on this journey. If it's all too hard for you and you want a broker, reach out to me at adam at the crypto.land. One of my staff will buy the crypto for you. They can either custody it for you or they can give it to you. Whichever you want, you're in control. If it's too hard, get someone else to do it. If you want to learn, you can do it. It's all about choice. It's all about freedom. Read my book, 28 Pro Trader Tips, The Art of Trading. Follow me on X or look at me on YouTube at Adam Stokes. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for your time tonight, Adam. As always, very much enjoy our philosophical uh, exploration of, of the future of money and, and finance and all those things. And uh, I always learn something. And uh, I think the chat appreciates it too. So uh, look forward to doing it again sometime down the track. And um, I'll take you offline. Have a great evening and uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you, Martin. Take care. There you go, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, always uh, learn something from Adam and uh, very, very interesting to uh, explore this uh, topics further, as we will, down the track. Next week, I'm going to have Damien Klassen on and we're going to look at the uh, no more normal markets from a perspective of uh, what's been happening. And I guess we'll touch on NVIDIA and those sorts of things and AI and how those markets are playing out. Um, thank you very much for uh, watching the show, folks. And uh, please like, subscribe and share. And uh, just a quick uh, view of the doggies. Yep, they're still there. They've hardly moved <laughs> all of the time. You might have heard a couple of uh, squeaks and things earlier on, but uh, they'll be ready for the next walk now. Anyway, I want to say thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you on the next show or check out my recorded shows. I put them up every day and I'll be back uh, same time next week. This is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. Take care.